For almost three weeks, I have held the strong opinion that The Long Night would go down as the worst, stupidest, most painful episode of Game of Thrones. Like, with only three episodes left, how could Dave and Dan even hope to beat the abject waste of potential that was The Long Night? We open on Varys, or however you pronounce it, writing a pointless letter. He has this small human try to poison Danny, but her new diet thwarts his master plan. She won't eat. John arrives on Dragonstone, having sailed from, from from somewhere, and says the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Just cross the trident. They'll be at the walls of King's Landing in two days. Two days? Two fucking days? Really? Man, things would have been way easier for Rob if everything was this close back in his day. Hey John, you wanna commit treason? So Varys has his first ever convo with Jono, talking treason out in the open with someone watching. The master of whisperers, ladies and gentlemen, sneakiest snooper to have ever snuck. Thurse says he's not quite sure if Danny shares her father's proclivity for being a violent cunt, which just shows that he hasn't really been paying attention. Tells Jon he should be king, but he's in stark denial of her madness. Say what you will about literally everything else, but at least this episode keeps Jon's character consistent. Stubborn loyalty, just like Pappy. No, not that one. Danny is reasonably upset that her unreasonable demands from last episode weren't kept. So she reacts to all this by executing Varys, cold shouldering Jon, listening to Nightwitch on repeat, and oh yeah, exploding a city, but for some reason Tyrion's off the hook. You don't have to give him special treatment just because he's a dwarf, you know. Ah, oh, so Varys doesn't share the info with anyone else. Was this the only letter? Does he want Jon on the throne or not? What the fuck is going on? He takes off his promise rings and just kind of waits to be captured and killed. Yes, this is the same Varys from season 1. Yes, that one. The one who mysteriously managed to sneak his way to the top of Marine at the end of season 5. The one who has evaded any consequences for anything he's ever done. The one whose top move is switching sides without losing his head. That Varys. Just waits to be killed. Turns out he was an extremely lucky moron all along. Tyrion and Varys share a scene without a single joke about penises or lack thereof. Benioff, Weiss, I commend your restraint. Wait, no last words? Are you fuck? Power resides where men believe it resides. Yeah, nah mate, power resides in the giant fucking dragon. Varys gets executed because he was the only one dumb enough to openly discuss treason. At least Tyrion had the courtesy to do it behind closed doors. Rip Varys. I've always hated the bells. Thanks for the ride, Conleth. Then there's this scene, I don't fucking- John walks in and Danny starts talking one of those made up languages as a power move. And then, ahem. She killed Varys as much as I did. Tracaris. She killed Varys. <laughs> She killed Varys as much as I did. Tracaris. Fee for only following otters. Sansa never said a fucking word to Varys. This is mental. Is Sansa also responsible for exploding King's Landing? Jon isn't DTF, so I guess this is also his fault. In Marine, the slaves turned on the masters and liberated the city themselves. And that's confirmation that Danny drank the amnesia water. You armed the slaves. Marine's liberation was not just up to the populace. Danny commands Wormo to sail the immortal Unsullied to King's Landing. It'll be safe because the Iron Fleet is still in its cooldown phase. If the city surrenders, they will ring the bells and raise the gates. Hey, Tyrion! Remember when you were the commander defending King's Landing? Remember when the bells rang during that battle and how that was you surrendering? Yeah, that's why you lost that battle and Stannis captured and beheaded you. Was this script a first draft? If the city surrenders, they will ring the bells and raise the gates. I've never known bells to mean surrender. They will ring the bells. I've always hated the bells. They ring for horror. A dead king, a city under siege. A wedding. They will ring the bells. T-Dog learns that Jamie's character has died and his body captured. Danny says the next time he fails her will be the last, which I suppose means that she only believes in second chances for eunuchs, but as many as 18th chances for dwarves. Single file, you ass bags. As our heroes land next to the city, evading the non-existent Iron Fleet, we get our 105th consecutive conversation between Tyrion and Dave where old mate fails to mention his dead son. Consistency is key. T-Bone asks him to help smuggle Jamie and Cersei out of King's Landing, which hurts my soul. Dude, you were almost there. But what if instead you smuggled someone into the keep to just like kind of capture Cersei and then bring her back and then the war's over? You know, maybe someone who's invincible and infallible and hey, aren't you supposed to be a genius? So Jamie got captured trying to get into King's Landing, but Aya somehow gets away with it even though she's been telling her name and life story to everyone she meets. Ah ha 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 ha! Tyrion can't speak the language good! Ah ha 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 ha! 
haha. Why is this scene in here? How is this season at once both extremely rushed and also bloated with pointless shit? Oh no, now Jamie has amnesia. He's completely forgotten about the time he killed Eris to save half a million people, even though it's the defining point in his life. Does Syrian even know the truth about that? Now would have been a great time to tell him. Ah oh, well, I guess you're off the list. I defended the city last time it was attacked. Wait, so you do remember Blackwater? Then what was this shit with the bells earlier and also later? Oh my god, this is doing my head in. Tyrion tells Jamie to escape to Pentos and Jamie's like, Sail right past the Iron Fleet. So I guess the cooldown's over now? What the fuck? Please stop. Does the Iron Fleet exist or not? This makes me feel so sad for all the writers out there who painstakingly check their work for internal consistency. The real MVPs. The end of this scene is actually fine. No Taisha, but it's touching. This bell tower has a cross on it. What happened to the heptagram, huh? Did the Westerosi know that Jesus died for our 15 million dollar budgets? So the city goes into lockdown and we see that Aya and Fido are in. Oh, and Jamie too. Wait, hang on. If Danny's forces were surrounding the city well enough to catch Jamie on his way through, then how are these civilians getting through to the city? What? Why was nobody stopping them? Why are people going past an army to get into the city that army is besieging? What the fuck? Do you want to be in a sack? Was anyone on the writing staff allowed to ask basic questions? I'm just an untrained dick nose on the internet, these questions should definitely not be making it as far as me. We have the Golden Company, can't wait to see them in battle. Oh, who are we fucking kidding? Hey Buck, love the armor, horse looks great, but you know all those men behind you in their beautiful gorgeous helmets? What does this show have against helmets? Helmets and logic, I swear. <sighs> Why is Tyrion here? At all? If you hear the bells ring, they've surrendered. Oh, that's why. To repeat this insane notion about the bells. That's it. He can go now. John doesn't look convinced, but that might just be Kit Harrington's acting face. TM. Cersei cleanly executes her signature move of looking out of a balcony instead of doing anything. You earn that paycheck, Lena. The cool kids make it into the VIP room just before the bouncer pulls across the velvet rope. Jamie's on the list, but the line's too long, so he says, fuck it, I'll climb in through the bog window. Don't laugh, you've all been there. Ugh, I fucking hate crowds. What the fuck did you think it was gonna be, you moron? Literally only one thing comes out of the sky in this show. So Danny steers right at the fleet because that worked so well last time, but I guess it does work now because she really means it this time. Or maybe she just fucking forgot again. I love how Euron waits until the dragon is right in fucking front of him before he decides, yeah, reckon I'll bail now. I got a crew full of mutes. Turn around! Drogon isn't hit by anything because A, lol, how could anything hit a dragon in midair, especially three times in a row? That would be ridiculous. And two, who even needs tension? Wormo shafts Buck Strickland before the guy gets to do a single thing, but I guess that counts as a named character death, so rip. How I'll miss the way you stood around doing nothing. Thing. There are props I've had more emotional investment in than Buck Strickland. Why did we even bother with the Golden Company? Why did we bother with the Prince of Dawn? Why are we still watching this? Anyway, the dragon looks really cool and the fire is super epic and yeah dude, now it's battle time so turn your brain off and get ready to defend poor writing on the internet. Cersei likes the light show almost as much as the people who watch this show in bars. <laughs> and decides to stick around instead of instantly fleeing. Tyrion is still here too? Now may not be the best time for a leisurely stroll. Kyburn basically tells Cersei they're boned, but as we all know, Cersei doesn't mind a decent boning every now and then. Our men will fight harder than sellswords ever could. Hey yeah, so why did we even get the sellswords? Kinda seems like a giant waste of money. The Red Keep has never fallen. It won't fall today. Yeah, well, the Rhoyne isn't just a river in Essos. The Lannister army, or at least this contingent of it, surrenders just in time for Danny's coin to land. For some reason, the people of King's Landing also think that the bells mean surrender. Did Kyburn teleport the city so close to Winterfell that they share the same amnesiatic water supply? So the bells ring, but that sound just pisses Danny off like Venom in Spider-Man 3, which I would actually prefer to be watching right now. And so, as Danny proves Varys right, we reach the peak of a sequence of writing decisions so baffling, awful, and laughable that now is the perfect time to attempt the longest fuck in all of media critique. <clears throat> fuck! If you want to sit on the throne your ancestors built, you must win it. That will mean blood on your hands before the thing is done. The blood of my enemies, not the blood of innocents. We have 200,000 reasons to take the city. In all seven kingdoms, men will live without fear and cruelty. Wow! Under their rightful queen. Together, we will save this country from those who would destroy it.
Wormo joins the slaughter because value McGoolies and all, but John and Davos refuse to charge because they're so moral. Did Cersei's legs stop working? Move, you idiot, move! Danny even gets a tower of the keep and Cersei's like, just gonna see how this plays out, boys. John stops a rape because, come on, man, we're only here to mass murder. Then the funniest thing ever happens. Kingslayer! What the fuck? How? Did Feathersword get battle tips from Bran? Hey, what's that over there? Is that the script? Euron tells Jamie that he boned Cersei, so the two engage in the worst edited sword fight in recent memory. Truly the showdown we all needed to see. There's no conflict at all over the paternity of Cersei's baby. It isn't even brought up, so I guess there was no point to that. Euron stabs Jamie, but I'm sure it'll be fine. Cersei finally decides to leave, and she's crying because she didn't get to see the wildfire go off. Missed it by that much. So there's supposed to be wildfire all over the city. Why is it only now starting to go off? Well, you got me. By all accounts, it doesn't make sense. Junk Spiro gets an insurance stab, but it isn't enough to stop Jim from shafting him real good. God, I'm glad Jamie gets to kill Euron instead of Theon or Yara. Good thing we avoided that potential disaster. Aya and Rex just kind of walk into the keep, and Sandor convinces Aya to leave, telling her to not become consumed by revenge. This works as Aya has amnesia and doesn't remember that she's already become consumed by revenge. She says his real name and thanks him, and that's cute, but dude, come on, this is how how are you gonna do it? Aya is now completely pointless in the episode. What do we get from her perspective? The result of Danny's destruction? We're already seeing that through John and Tyrion, but they already stopped showing us Tyrion because it's dumb to have two points of view demonstrating the exact same thing. Wow, Cersei really had slim pickings for the Queen's Guard. Greg turns out actually has free will now. Ah, Frankenstein's monster, Frankenstein's Frankenstein. Rip. Cersei just kinda expects Sandor to let her walk past. What? Clegane Ball finally occurs. <laughs> Jamie materializes from thin air, and what a day this is for Cersei. Jamie somehow climbed all those steps with multiple serious stab wounds. I think this one's right in the kidney, but Cersei acknowledges that he's hurt, so it is no longer an issue. Sandor's normal ass sword somehow goes through all this armor, but at least this fight isn't edited like ass. Aya walks around, no doubt looking for a plot to be a part of and eventually ruin. Yes, yes, war is hell, indeed. That's why we gratuitously indulged in displaying it to get the fan boner going. Greg tries to Ober and Sandor, Sandor tries to jory Greg, neither work. Instead, they decide to Tommen together, and that finally does work. Rip John sees Wildfire inexplicably go off now instead of 20 minutes ago. He's sick of this party and tries to get everyone to leave. Aya comes to and she's severely damaged after having done nothing. Quick reminder that this is what Aya looked like after stopping the apocalypse. She's put in perilous situation after perilous situation, but there's zero tension because we all know she's going to live, and even if she does die, it would be extremely contrived as we've seen her live through everything else. This is one of the reasons you can't relate to Arya and feel naught but the spectacle in her actions. This is what happens when your story is devoid of logical consequences. Arya should have fought Gregor. And I don't mean have a cool little fight where she's all whooshy whooshy and he can't catch her. I mean have Gregor beat Arya within an inch of her fucking life. Then Sandor saves her. His story not ending purely in revenge, but in the heroic moment of sacrifice to save the one person who truly cared for him. Then maybe Jon finds Arya almost dead and that pushes him over over the edge concerning Danny. Bonus points if the little psycho actually dies in his arms. All of this trying to save civilian shit can be John's job, or better yet, the episode could be shorter. Finn and Rose are bamboozled by rubble, and this time Ray isn't around to lift some rocks. Hang on. Cersei says, I want our baby to live. If that's fucking so, then why were you standing on that balcony for eight years while a dragon exploded everything? Also, does that mean this was non-alcoholic wine in episode one? She then says what we've all been thinking since season seven. <laughs> <laughs> then they get crushed by Brick's lol. We'll have a chat about Jamie and how to unredeem a character once the dust has settled. Maybe you'll want to subscribe to catch that one. Same goes for Danny and how to fight tyranny with tyranny. Actually, was Cersei a tyrant? Did we ever see her enact injustices on the innocent small folk, or just her political adversaries? Hmm. Then Aya wakes up looking worse than me after a night on the lash, and she catches an ubu out of the city. If you're unsure why Aya isn't dead, it's because she's a secret Targaryen, and as we all know, Targaryens are fireproof. Am I supposed to think this is Buck Strickland's horse? Because it isn't. And if it is, it's hilarious that that's the ultimate purpose of the Golden Company, to give Aya a lift. So is this the biblical pale horse of death, or is it not, because it's 
fucking white and not pale. Aya must then be conquest or pestilence or biblical references don't belong in Game of Thrones and this is just yet another plain inexcusable contrivance. Which I guess describes the whole episode. But is it worse than The Long Night? Well, was Nagasaki worse than Hiroshima? Fewer casualties, sure, but you still dropped a fucking atomic bomb. The Bells get seven seasons of character development out of seven because Gilly finally got the happy ending she deserves. How can they ruin my favorite TV show? Wait, what the fuck happened to character arcs?